you know, the, the dictum is, you know, first do no harm. I didn't know what I was going to do, and people around me really weren't able to answer what potential harm. So I looked at the literature relative to all aspects of growth hormone IGF-1, testosterone, byproducts, uh, dihydrotestosterone, and this is what came about. Um, some of you have seen this. What I use as a dictum and how I practice is I look at all sides of the argument in order to accumulate information on the positive and the negative, and based upon the weight of each side, directs me. And in a dynamic issue, because tomorrow, or as Michael has offered, some articles from Dr. Morgenthaler, which one article shifting a little bit this way, it's the overall weight of the information. And one of the major things that I found for myself, as well as in the group of physicians I work with in the Southern California area, is that we're all fearful about changing what we're doing, but there's hope to encourage us to go ahead and to change, and it's only through the documentation that gives us the confidence to do it. So in understanding where I was going, I had to see the benefits against the, the risks. And first off, a lot of the benefits, which we've already seen over the talks recently, uh, about uh, benefits of growth hormone in perioperative uh, surgical cases, abdominal, they healed more rapidly. Uh, growth hormone and peripheral monocytes, uh, mononuclear cells, improving the immune system, interferon production, healing, uh, surveillance uh, polymorphal nucleosides and bacterial surveillance, um, cerebral metabolism, which you've had heard from me, ad nauseum, um, heart benefits, cardiovascular benefits are now known to be C-reactive protein and nitric oxide. In the past, when I started, we didn't know specifically. It was just a finding improvement, a, be a better outcome. Now we know it's the interaction between C-reactive protein and nitric oxide. Fracture healing out of uh, Harvard School of Medicine, the improvement in bone, um, atherosclerosis, sclerosis, uh, reversal, uh, the issue with the 19, this is the full text of that 71-year-old gal who had an option of amputation or testosterone. Obviously, after eight months, the testosterone was a better choice. Uh, hemodynamic changes in heart disease, um, atherosclerosis, testosterone inhibits early atherosclerosis by conversion to estradiol. Mortality, morbidity associated with testosterone growth hormone use uh, at this time was zero. In a um, movie that was just, um, well, not just, it was released called Bigger, Better, Faster, um, they had a slide up. It was a full-blown movie that was, you know, had all the releases and whatever. Where they had a slide, there were 40, uh, 75,000 deaths in the United States during this time frame from cigarette smoking, 45,000 relative to alcohol, and three maybe from hormone replacement. Um, in the United States, there's um, 2 million um, reports of adverse drug reaction with 100,000, and it's really 100 to 170,000 deaths per year from all the medications that we use in the United States. So there is risk, and so you have to balance what we're doing as traditional physicians to what we're doing in anti-aging, and how much more risk do we bring to the foreground. And uh, do you know what the death rate was in uh, 10 years of Vietnam? How many people died? 56,000 in 10 years. This is one year, 100 to 170,000. This is just looking at uh, cancer risk for testosterone growth hormone based upon looking at prostate and prostate alone. And these are just the numbers of what's around the world. Australia was 12,776, and what's the population? 20, 30 million? 20 million? Oh, they're going to the United States. And in the United States, it's 34 million. We're 250 million people. So proportionately, there seems to be a little bit more here in Australia. This was an article that looked at uh, the PSA levels and um, the risk of uh, prostate cancer. And as I shared with you yesterday, the other study with 233,000 people from Damon Lab out of Chicago showing that there was 29% uh, more cancers between 2.5 and 4. The point will be made shortly. Oh, this is it. This was biopsy at PSA levels of 2.5. Uh, no, my lightsaber I left in the ship. Um, with the occurrence of, um, where was it, 20, 
well, 30.1 percent men between 4 and 10, and then 27.5 percent between 2.5 uh, and 4 percent. So there are potentially cancers that we're missing in the prostate, even though we're measuring levels that are considered to be normal. It's what I proposed was that when we do see those cancers in of the prostate and we are using water or vitamins or testosterone, that maybe it had nothing to do with them, but it was the missed cancers that were there, the 30 percent. Don't know. Growth hormone risk for cancer. Um, growth hormone IGF-1 in cancer, um, less intervention to avoid cancers. Um, in this study, they actually said that uh, growth hormone increased the occurrence of cancer, but what was missed, if you had to actually read the article, not the abstract of it, was that they included in this people who had received uh, radiation therapy, who had received um, uh, growth hormone from um, cadavers or from monkeys, and that's what was included in this stomach, in the story, uh, in the report. So we don't really know where it came from. Uh, mortality out outcome in acromegaly indicates that 60% succumb to cardiovascular disease, 25 from respiratory, and 15% deaths from malignancies. Well, if in that year, 2001, looking back on the National Institute of Health, looking at the general population occurrence of cancers, it was 19.1 percent. But if you had acromegaly, an excessive amount of growth hormone, you only had 15 percent. So there was a 4 percent difference improvement if you had excessive amount of growth hormone. One would expect that the level of cancers would have been much higher if there was an association. Um, this is a 2001 Shlomo Melmed, uh, Shlomo Melmed, South African. You're South African? It could be, maybe. I think you are. You sound like Shlomo. Shlomo Melmed, uh, UCLA, uh, head of uh, the Burns and Allen uh, Department of Endocrinology. Back then, in the early 2000s, late 1990s and uh, 2000, he was very inspirational in my going full force into anti-aging medicine because he was very positive about everything, kept on reporting uh, that everything was fine uh, in op opposition to a Dr. Michael Pollack at um, McGill University in Canada who always said, oh, it was horrible stuff. Now that the dollar's more profitable on the side refuting everything that we're doing, he's now talking uh, negatively about growth hormone. Um, this is uh, acromegaly and cancer risk, standardized incident ratio 95. Uh, this was cancer risk among 1,634 patients with acromegaly over 15 to 28, uh, 28 years. 177 patients had diagnosed of cancer compared with uh, 116 without that. Again, they did not include secondary cancers due to radiation therapy for other medical conditions. So the information was uh, skewed and um, uh, embellished by not clearly stating that there were other things which were important as uh, predecessors for or precipitators of cancer. And this is what happens in the literature is that the presentation of the information is not totally straight, straightforward, because they're trying to promote their own agenda. And if you read through the literature and you read scientific information, looking statistically, looking at the sample numbers and everything, you'll come across a lot of articles which promote one side, positive or negative, which are bullshit, which were done just to promote the ego and the aspirations of the person reporting it. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, increased uh, growth hormone has been in acromegaly, which is about 20 times the level in normal, which is about 40 times the level that we use in treatment. Um, was associated with benign prostatic hypertrophy, but not with um, prostate, breast, or lung cancer. And that's uh, um, that was a UCLA study from 1999. Low risk of gastrointestinal tumors recurrence after uh, post-operative treatment with recombinant growth hormone. They actually gave growth hormone to these people who had uh, cancer. Didn't change anything. Didn't increase it. Prostate cancer, um, 